I'm Kay Gabriel. I'm going to read an epistolary poem um, that I wrote for my friend Joe. I could go on. Dear Joe, good morning. I'm shallow, sleepless, irrepressible. Does that endear me to you? 5 a.m. in March, wind smacks the skylight and hustles refuse over Flatbush like somebody's idea of a zeitgeist. Hi, it says, time to nap, but instead I'm writing testaments of what and who I love. Mike is sleeping in my bed, warm and furred like a cat with a beard and a tattoo sleeve. Maybe he would resent that description. I can do no other. I'm awake in another room, achieving nothing in the second person singular. Hello. I do it for God in the television with a promiscuous heart. I do it with prosthetics, but apropos of anybody with an opinion about them, you are forbidden, I want to say, from evaluating my component parts. I am an atom. Fuck a metonymy. Fuck a catalog. First, I composed that sentence. And then I felt myself get eye-banged by every guy with a beard on the subway platform. Don't think, Joe, I didn't sometimes return the favor. Mike's gone now, who brought me Oreos and spooned while I dreamt my nipples turned into mice and died. It's spring, and I'm eyeing every aging wonder boy in the park, plus his leanly pumping quads. There's sprigs of magnificent hair. There's even crocuses. Furious purple, delicate violet, contemptuous yellow. Now I'm on a train. Hello. My imaginative lusts riddle bullet holes in the sides, side of the achievable. Have you ever wanted to get fucked by an abdomen, an armpit, a couple of peddling legs? My preferred position with C, for instance, letting him pile drive my face from above. I lay down in my bed like a failed porn actor. I can imagine the camera fixed on my dewy lined eyes, the bottom half of my face obscured under a cock and a tremendous cupid's bow. My cheeks sharp enough to be an architectural instrument, as both of us try to remember our lines. But from this point of view, it's more like sex with a wiry frame and faded punk tattoos. Halfway into Jersey anyways, and I'm thinking about your letter, poem, whatever, All I Want by Joni Mitchell, where every paragraph begins, I want. I is the letter's only person, want its only verb. It's Monday morning, what do I want? The flourishing of bees and grasses, never for anyone to pay rent, for the landlord to stop, for fuck's sake, spying on us. Also a backyard, to speak veritably about no appetite. Never again authenticated. No more bad faith prurience. No more AWP. My done taxes. A living wage for CUNY adjuncts. No moving apartments. No falling to pieces. Various men, if only they could finger. Only some items impossible. Some are consequential. I fill up the tank and say good night and go. I could go on. Patty Schemmel writes in her memoir that she joined whole after doll parts was already cut, but wrote a new drumline for the end and can still hear the more ambitious resonance of her snare in the final 16 bars or so, sounding a hollow trench for Courtney's appetite. I fake it so real. I regularly dream I'm in a band, but of course can play no instrument. Instead, I writhe on stage, exacerbating attention, my face flushing while really my ears and my own desperate hot need to be seen. Dear Joe, you get me. So what if I want to be embarrassed? Usually I feel like telling anybody your dreams feels like showing your ass to strangers. Well, so what if they look at what's good for them? Last night dreamt of being flat, ran all night to the top of my own dimension, night before the dream about the mice. Then I came into possession of an immense stash. Pursued by dream police, I hid my ketamine in the pastel candy shop of other pharmaceuticals. Even in dreams, I can purloin a letter. But the cops in my head got wise to the trick, even to a daring cinematic escape down a garbage chute where a man with facial hair tried to recall my identity. By train through Jersey, no spring here yet. Everything brown, enclosed, backyarded. And what have they done with my full stops? The Wawa in reach. I'm Duncan. I'm somebody's sugary kid. Call, embar call embarrassment less a discomforting bug and more an intransigent object of mega fixation, a hot flash and indisputable, even if unconfirmed, uh, certainty of occupying somebody's attention despite themselves. Whether in vexation, mockery, or aimless arousal, though maybe now my sense of shame, a fruit rotted, rotted on the vine. Like, for instance, to trick myself back to sleep, watch videos of anybody else eating things I can't or won't, like soups and noodles, foods on a stick, McDonald's breakfasts, lunch meats, eggs fried into toast, oh hell. As in a letter from or a season in. A staycation in hell. Good hell morning, I haven't slept again. I think I'm Emerus infrastructure. 
Joe, I think you're a lyricist of infatuation, and I'm a geographer of arousal. What, if any, is the relevant difference? How will we be graded? I'm a slice of cake and cream. I'm Michelle Trachtenberg in Mysterious Skin, and you're my malfortunate Joseph Gordon-Levitt. We applaud each other's poor decisions. Late for work again, good night, you run up my phone bill. I lie for hours in the hot water. We toast with our remaining vices and make up about it. Mutual spectators in the tragedy of semi-notorious men. Does that endear me to you? We're on the run from one to another parking lot, one of us a cavalier drifter with life by the balls, the other a neurotic, but the better driver. With hair the color of eyeliner, which am I? You're a caramelized peach, poached, juiced, even at a distance so inconvenient it would take a day to reach you by bus on several tumescent roads. Can you hear me where you sleep? Dear Joe, I want to finger fuck my boyfriend in this bar, and I want you to know I'm thinking about it. Surprise! With love at a boil, and Happy New Year. Hello, I'm Patricia Spears-Jones, and I'm going to be reading Thomatic Ritual Poem Number 1, The Mapping, uh, which was based on a uh, proposal from Kazem Ali. Hub encircled. Lines once surveyed atop the farmed land, once hunting, resting, playing grounds for the Lenape. Then Dutch gentle rousers, moneyed, profit seeking, all landed here. Give way to church bells, pews, glassed windows, brilliant with colors, huge trees, branches, failed, settlers' houses built, burned down, built again, rebuilt. Profit making bricks arrive. And ex slaves are forbidden to sit where they want to. The church rebukes their worship. Only in Brooklyn are they treated with equanimity, the pews available to all who find joy in the word. And yet later, the dancers arrived, swirling their floaty bodies. Then later, the radical priests expanding their mission the poor children from across Second Avenue, down 10th Street, over to the projects. Their names live in stories collected in the railroad apartments, home to many who hear the bells but never enter. And then the poets loud, the true churchyard saints smoking near 11th Street, where the sad walking hookers tripped in daylight. The poets loud, the true saints sit in chairs where the pews were, the ones forbidden, the ones burned. The poets loud circle the city's dreamscape. New Year's Day, that old burst of Zion, cross to the left, cross to the right. Cars, trucks, buses, wheels upon wheels, that old burst of Zion. Sirens blinking the will of ancestors. Traffic rolls down 2nd Avenue towards the Battery, the edge of Mahatta. The Folly are singing, some stars keep falling. Bells ring, bells ring. Thank you. Hi, this is Ada Limon, and Happy New Year, Happy Poetry Marathon Day. I wish we were all together at, in St. Mark's um, Poetry Project. Thank you. I'm just going to read two poems. The Leash After the birthing of bombs of forks and fear and the frantic automatic weapons unleashed the spray of bullets into a crowd holding hands, the brute sky opening in a slate metal maw that swallows only the unsayable in each of us. What's left? Even the hidden nowhere river is poisoned, orange and acidic by a coal mine. How can you not fear humanity? Want to lick the creek bottom dry to suck the deadly water up into your own lungs like venom? Reader, I want to say, don't die. 
even when silvery fish after fish comes back belly up and the country plummets into a crepitating crater of hatred, isn't there still something singing? The truth is, I don't know. But sometimes I swear I hear it, the wound closing like a rusted over garage door, and I can still move my living limbs into the world without too much pain can still marvel at how the dog runs straight towards the pickup trucks, breaknecking down the road because she thinks she loves them. Because she's sure, without a doubt, that the loud, roaring things will love her back. Her soft, small self alive with desire to share her goddamn enthusiasm. Until I yank the leash back to save her because I want her to survive forever. Don't die, I say. And we decide to walk for a bit longer, starlings high and fevered above us, winter coming to lay her cold corpse down upon this little plot of earth. Perhaps we are always hurtling our bodies toward the thing that will obliterate us, begging for love from the speeding passage of time. And so maybe, like the dog obedient at my heels, we can walk together, peacefully, at least until the next truck comes. A poem for peace, my friends, uh, and another uh, short poem um, about hope, and we're entering the deep winter, and um, I, those of you who know me know I, I don't like winter, um, and so this is a poem for spring. Those of you, those of us who might need a little hopeful poem. Instructions on not giving up. More than the fuchsia funnels breaking out of the crab apple tree. More than the neighbor's almost obscene display of cherry limbs shoving their cotton candy colored blossoms into the slate sky of spring rains. It's the greening of the trees that really gets to me. When all the shock of white and taffy, the world's baubles and trinkets, leave the pavement strewn with the confetti of aftermath, the leaves come, patient, plodding, a green skin growing over whatever winter did to us, a return to the strange idea of continuous living, despite the mess of us, the hurt, the empty, Fine then, I'll take it, the tree seems to say, a new slick leaf unfurling like a fist to an open palm. I'll take it all. Thank you. Happy New Year. Okay, the deluge in formation. If one believes one's self as stasis, there exists no seepage, no neural density or scar. One then saturates as ash, as pointless cannibal's lethargy, as dislodged ink from a podium or a treatise. One comes to know demobility as a craft, as an arc which solders itself to specifics. Yet to know one's non-sequestered through mundane advancement as doorway or basic habit as speculation. I'm speaking of chastisement or cross-referential superimposition. Within this condition, I'm more like a crow from crucial underwater fires, a crucial underwater crow, neither Chinese nor Shinto but of the black dimensionality as hidden underwater mass, which persists by daring, which seems at the surface a purposeless kinetic or pointless mandrels infection. Saying such, I consider myself a reddish Shinto crow, then just as strongly a black anathema crow, then just as quickly a sun-fed crow from snow-washed volcanoes. So I look to myself as winter, 
as inclement carrion manga, as flight through pointless, through great electrical haze. I being blur who shapes the Empyrean, who invokes withdrawal, who instills in his forces stunning psychic transference. Okay. I'll read uh, from my, this New Directions volume entitled The Sri Lankan Loxodrome. Entitled of Nexus of Phantoms. In a lower key cave, motions exist of disintegrated swans in a trance located lake brimming with harvested poisons sealed by corruptive post mortems. Such swans, staggered by microbial reasoning, their aggressive nest anatomical with anomaly with drifts of strenuous incarnadine leanings, with a thirst which hurdles conspiratorial invasives, alive with cortical, with coronal oceanics, open like a clouded trail of rendings. Analogous with the ox, the pelicans, the mergansers, perhaps with the petrels and the gannets, under the power of darted mocking orations. The swans, Looking back on solemn blood perusal, like a form of death breaking roses on the shore. It is as if the example of phonograms of lost and compacted lenses were turning within a charismatic fall line or an isonep, or what an avian would announce in Greenland as a catabotic wind. The swans, like a haze of magnetism or imploded gondola locations where the scent of each lorikeet is consumed and brought to dazzling eclipse refulgence. In another foci, in another depth, their form self-challenged in a cloak of suns, their power de-revealed with seven moons burning, reduced to two intense incendiary magnets. And these incendiary magnets like a nexus of phantoms scattered across the geometric optometry. There is another one here. There's a final poem from, it's called The Pulpit Avignon. It's from the um, City Lights volume, Compression Impurity. And, and it's a longer piece. The Puppet Avignon. I remain the Puppet Avignon because nothing in this world can conceal me. I test the limits of my evil, prone as I am to bloody offspring by debacle. I being the leathery witness of evil, I being the culture of the offspring of evil, I who ferry toxins on the Sabbath, I who blossom by means of spillage and errata, seek in his conclusives to amalgamate hypocrisy, to ascribe to force a plain and turbulent bleeding. Assured that my own hosannas resound, that the force of my name alters cataracts in hell, because I can in no way do otherwise, perhaps pontificate, announce bread, breathe scars on my flanks as signs from the above, raising as I do certain virgins up from hell, extracting a carnal medicine from my eyelids. I left Rome to inculcate the Bosphorus. Thus, I remain strategic in that my eyes are flawed, that my hands are tragically spent. This, the charismatic occurrence of I who seem to dwell within the pastures of deeper sweltering. I, being the sorcerer who shreds gowns, who creates justice and life by supreme and opulent verdict, by miasma which lingers and verifies confusion, by the dark forms of sand, by the diamonds which erupt eros that would lead one to believe that I am clinging to ruination, to inconsolable payment, for making land conform to the project of wind, to the object of rent wheat. Thus, 
I am posterior to different forms which inhale the sun. Thus, I'm recondite by instability, having fathered two magnetic serpents in my struggle with containment. Of course, I am divided, miasmatic and melancholic. Thus, I grant myself the folly, the ambrosia, the scales that weigh cunning in my mitre. Thus, I trespass heaven and ascend through stars through nucleic transposition. Thus the bishops advance my meddlesome fornication, one by one advancing my secrets, absorbing a tacit henbane in the skin. And one by one they'll fail, as if a medley of serpents conspired against their treason. And when they die, I'll give them over to God. I'll say that they possess a cleansed rooting and an ochre foil in their hearts. I'll say that their secret assignations were justified by limit, by double fathering in the genes, so that their offspring will conspire to teach me consummation, to take in the soils from amniotic shelters with codes which reveal the lower constituency of boasting. I am a miracle in this regard. I control by lamentation, by fragments and disbelief, by feral conundrum as status. Thus, I cohabit on sheets of coal because each contaminant strengthens as if I pulled a fetid sheaf from legumes and traded various boats of opal along with a cardinal or reddish manganese. And so amidst the routes of the Bosphorus, they admit my own accursedness, yet they shield me, they offer intrigue, they offer foregone specifics so as to shelter my mission, knowing as they know that gold condenses it as evil, that Jesus Christ limits and is sorceress and askew. They know comedic investigations. They know the stolen urns, the non-recorded labor. They know that the one true God has never amended his thinking, a struggle with his own catharsis. Understanding that I've stepped with the offspring of eels, I've hidden a lamb in my garments, having struggled with beasts and all the four-legged raptors. Thus, I've come to my decision to slaughter as opposed to retainment, always concocting in my brain the structure and physiology of monsters. from an ongoing untitled poem for Lewis Warsh. I started writing to be myself. Now I start by imagining someone else. Don't worry about pretending I'm not trying to be you without finding myself. All over in advance on a Gens plateau, the writing's in the arrangement, but it, a pronoun, was never meant to begin. Sleep on the couch in the monster's tower, walking single file away from destruction. Monsters in dreams may know when to leave. Sleep on the couch and wake up pantsless in Berkeley at a party to celebrate your leaving for work. Go straight awake to Zoom to lie and miss the conversation that made the reading worth attending. Minor flashes of disgathering light the year may attempt to deny its own end. But it also only began because a number said to begin. All us non-numbers want the year to end. It feels like the last non-digression as they year to choose between shoe or tree in a circle of years and leave the speaker a mouth for a map. Don't swat the fruit fly that's been landing near you all day. It's been through its own year, hovering near the edge of the page prior. The only opinion I could type was hostile dithering. Buses pass, speaking silently, masks required. The barrier to my left, not the margin, which is also a barrier, may not appreciate my handwriting or general presence. Why would someone write something like that? Well, I'm not someone, and I only write like when I'm grieving, which is almost always with intermittence and intermittence. Today's conversation on Bin Laden was incredibly boring, but it's 2020 and there are so many other agonistic layers to work life. Different day, different fruit fly on the other page. My brother has written a poem about all the times he's moved. When I finish the page, I'm going to text him and tell him next he should write a poem about all the times he's been moved. And then work ethics were revealed to be an intense series of overcompensations. 
though we knew that already but hadn't said so aloud. I want to read Fife Dog's mom's memoir about Fife. The uninteresting pier building behind the You Go Girl graffiti just turned bright blood red. Turning things around has a quiet crush on last chance. Everyone digs it when you admit writing near strangers. He emptied many little bags into the East River and slapped each one on the rail when he was done. Subways eating each other, I mean passing on the Williamsburg Bridge. You too may be eaten by someone simply passing by. We just pulled into the garage's attic, strange to see a blue and white dotted comforter underwater. Don't touch anything, don't breathe, don't be near. What appeared to be morning haze on Eldridge was really smoke from the West Coast fires. The coast took turns absorbing punishment this year, like the quiz we find deliveries in our flaws. To withhold with total intimacy, to flirt only with estrangement, to wander secretly into a microphone. Three seconds of rain, three smears of raindrops, I see you in leather and stories on a phone. The sum of all my trinkets. I want this to be something else so I can show it off before burying it. I want to churn butter on stage. Well, maybe not. Maybe that's too much setup. I want one more conversation with Lewis, an actual goodbye to Ted G. Another word with Bill, who made taking anyone seriously feel like the elegant thing to do. Yep, Anina, too late, again. I wonder what it would be like to be a punchline machine. No, I wonder what a punchline machine feels no like. I hate like. That's my new position, to hate like. Like is no longer an interesting, an intermediary I'm willing to accept. Not that like cares. I clearly care too much. And this has always been a problem for me, though. I try not to let people know I care too much. And that has also become a problem. If you used to love me, but you replaced me in your heart with Jesus, I'm cool with that. You could even say I'm relieved, though you might find it strange to say that yourself. I have loved so many people secretly, I wonder if I'm not on trial somewhere in an empty courtroom. If you've ever suspected I love you, I hereby give you permission to validate your suspicion. Unless you think it won't help. We may have to discuss what help means. But we also may never get to speak in person again, and defining or redefining help between us is a conversation I can only have in person. In person is a strange phrase, too. I haven't felt in person for a long time, but apparently being in person means someone else is there. I think that's wrong. But who cares what I think? Now I'm stuck between is there and who cares. Our pronoun-based phrases are wildly inaccurate for all situations. I wish they had been available when I was a kid. Less and less obviously it all shakes down to the mesh, an awkwardly amused pathos conjoined with a failing ability not to notice the house band made of special guests. Goodbye, bad year. Hi, this is Yin Yi, and I'm going to be reading uh, an excerpt from Basho, and then um, four of my own poems. The Narrow Road to the Deep North Days and months are travelers of eternity. So are the years that pass by. Those who steer a boat across the sea or drive a horse over the earth till they succumb to the weight of years spend every minute of their lives traveling. There are a number of ancients, too, who died on the road. I myself have been tempted for a long time by the cloud-moving wind, filled with a strong desire to wander. So, three poems from The Year of Blue Water. Even though I didn't know M very well, I am also grieving. I don't feel like I'm allowed to grieve for someone I didn't know well, because we're asked to choose who we invest in. We're asked to choose who is worthy of love. M lived in my community. I saw her every so often at parties, dinners, movies. I love my community, and therefore I love her. So of course I am grieving. It is justified to love another human being for no reason. My friends know how she lived, and they will live instead. When she was alive, she lived with my friends. Together they made all kinds of life. And now she lives in their lives, and can live with me.
Frank O'Hara's Morning is the first poem I consciously memorized. I am writing it in Wei Ming's letter, and I am rereading it this morning very slowly. Seeing the text, I realize that I have memorized some parts incorrectly. At first, I was not reading it. I was reciting it from that place where rhythms and bodies begin to stay with each other. Reciting quickly because I needed to catch the rhythm as it happened to me, so that I would not lose the music of the poem, and therefore the poem. Right now, losing the poem as it exists may not be the worst thing. If I really knew it, I could do it at any speed. You tell me that the old you is dead. I am also not who I used to be. The revolution is emotional. I found a reason to not fear death. I found more reasons to live, reasons to change what is living inside me and around me. The revolution is that I care about my own safety, that I believe my life is valuable and worth pursuing. As in, I'm worth the work of transformations. As in, I do not fear how I will emerge from myself, or how many times. And this poem is from my book, my second book, uh, Dream of the Divided Field. Things We Didn't Know The moon's white tusk behind the trees is a loon. Its effect is the French of its English. The trees are standing though they must lie down, and in my body I know the sea is bobbing. I am watching news in every block's receding rooms. The street lights slink like the fox who slew before the cross in the garden. And in my body I know as though my legs are planted firmly in the sound. The fog is breathing on the waves. The trees are standing though they must lie down. I will never be the same. Thanks. I'm going to read a few poems um, called Slow Clues, which I first started writing as a kind of half joke with myself that turned serious um, around Irmiri Baraka's Slow Clues. Um, they're all indebted to him and to other people. Um, the ones that I'm going to read from are dedicated to him, to Nina Simone, and to my aunt, Angela Jackson. Slow coup for ancient music. Amiri, perhaps it have been nothing as it has been for some time now. The main thing lately I've been against is death. Sometimes still I fall into feeling a love for you as casual as communism, futured as it could have been from the outset, something to look forward to in this slow coup. Slow coup for tender arrivals. A being I like, you, unincarned but fleshed out in the explaining of things. You teach me how it is to play part to a circle and be of it, go closer to the source than beside. Make the bed, hold the hand, make the coil, undo earth's rounding, then round back, re-round. Slow coup for black gold. I live in that gin house and I crave your human touch. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free and the laziest gal in town. 
It is true. Nobody knows you when you're down and out, but I know through your love I shall be released. Please read me. The revolution will be an obeah woman and some sugar in my bowl. That's all I ask. That's all I want from you. And slow coup cool for mules and women. I take off my soaked quilt, which has loved me in to feeling that I could see you and you me, doll, as you look for our collective turning. It makes a steady rumble and seep. I have walked on blue-black water down Mississippi River Street and thought of what needs burning or breaking like the knees on our necks. All right, my name is Mahogany L. Brown. I am a poet, writer, organizer, and executive director of the Bowery Poetry Club. I'll be sharing a new poem uh, for this poetry marathon. Shout out to the Poetry Project for always being forward thinking um, in the trenches, working. Thank you for this space. A small payment. The Bay Area taught me the word pussy. The future taught me the word womb. I close my eyes to the light under me and look star ways. It be blinking like my belly, big and growing every day. Womb heavy with tomorrow. A baby with no name is a grace any which way they come. So let's call him future. Let's call her future. Let the baby call itself whatever it wants. The bridges burned. The newspapers burned. Down, down, down until the entire scorched earth smelled like ghost peppers. Stew taste good too. The hood taste good too. And for a minute, everybody walked around with a mask as if they wasn't already infected. The trees, the trees. The trees are firmly standing as they please. No noose, no noose, no swing low blues to burden the roots. Who believes the big house was designed to burn? Where did your tax dollars really go? My mama ain't survived for me to keep surviving. I tap my stomach. I sing beneath my breath like a swamp bubble reaching for air. Thrive. Thrive, thrive. Whatever happened to the babies, the ones that walked out of the womb vote ready? Whatever happened to the politicians? Who removed them from office? Is that a breeze? Every, every, every eye, sky side, eyes, bright flints, eyes are prizes and they belong to our kin. The babies are all right. They became voters and burned down every flag that haunted the people. The babies are all right. They pushed down fences and turned the wrecked steel into jungle gyms. The babies are all right. Black and brown and able-minded leaders. They got a sweet tooth for justice. They smell like cinnamon and nag champa. The thieves lost their tongues and hands. A small payment for all the space they stole. The babies removed them. The babies removed them. The babies removed them. And that breeze, that breeze is our ancestor's voice. Every sway is just a midday swing, calling we safely back home. Dream life. 
And if I have made the feeling real, I am content that the facts should be false. Feeling, indeed, has a higher truth in it than circumstance. It appeals to a larger jury for acquittal. It is approved or condemned by a better judge. And if I can catch this bolder and richer truth of feeling, I will not mind if the types of it are all fabrications. If I run over some sweet experience of love, must I make good the fact that the loved one lives, expose name and qualities to make your sympathies sound? Or shall I not rather be working upon higher and holier ground if I take the passion for itself and so weave it into words that you and every willing sufferer may recognize the fervor and forget the personality? Life, after all, is but a bundle of hints, each suggesting actual and positive development, but rarely reaching it. And as I recall these hints, and in fancy trace them to their issues, I am as truly dealing with life as if my life had dealt them all to me. And occasionally, you are not altogether yourself, but this you conceal. You have a dim recollection of love. It is a sad thing when late night has come and you call up in the darkness, quiet night of grief, dreamily watching the moon. You remember your fragmentary life. There is no such thing as blank in a world of thought. Each little episode of life is full, had we but the perception of its fullness. The blue hills beyond, with deep blue shadows gathered in their bosom, lie before me like mountains of years over which I shall climb through shadows to every action and emotion growing and gaining on the soul. After a time, it seems a long time, but it is in truth a very short time, you find it is done most carelessly. The meadow stretching away under its golden flood, waving, every affection has its tears and smiles. The sparrow that is twittering on the edge of my balcony is calling up to me this moment, a world of memories that reach over half my lifetime, and a world of hope that stretches farther than any flight of sparrows. Like a thirsty child, you stray in thought to that fountain of cheer and live again, your wild hope broken. There is only the dream of sitting in the moonlight during a countless succession of hours, and talking of poetry and nature, of destiny and love, but this cannot last. 